Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Foresight Talks webinar from the Institute for the Future, where we talk about um, the practice of foresight, all things about futures thinking. And we are here today with Lisa K. Solomon. I'm going to give folks just a minute or two to get uh, themselves settled on the line before we formally start but happy to have you here. And we have a poll here, as you can see, where we're asking people two questions. Uh, we're trying to get a sense of who's on the call and what's the balance between design and foresight with our attendees. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. So I'm going to formally open the session and um, we are broadcasting here from the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lynn Jeffrey, and this is the uh, second in our new series, webinar series called Foresight Talks, where we talk with practitioners, people who are doing really interesting things, um, often at the intersection of foresight, futures, design, innovation, strategy, um, activism, a whole bunch of intersections. That's what we're interested in here. Um, I lead the foresight training efforts at the Institute for the Future. And um, before we get started, I wanna just let people quickly know about those. If you haven't seen those, um, the link will be in the chat. We have a open enrollment three-day curriculum where we do an overview of the complete foresight practice for professionals. Um, happens four times a year here in, in California. Um, and also this year we are going to be in Helsinki in the next month and we'll be in Singapore in November. Um, some of those are already sold out, but if you're interested, please do get in touch with us. Um, and we will be in Europe and Asia also next year, in addition to being on both the East and the West Coast of the United States. We also have a new Design Futures course, which is really exciting. And um, that's going to be a two-day course. We're piloting the first one in December. So hope to see you there. Once again, for people who are just joining, um, we have two ways to communicate with us during this session. And Lisa and I are going to be talking for about half an hour, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So please do submit your questions. If you have a formal question, you can use the Q&A function. It works really well. It allows us to, you can like questions other people have submitted. It gives us a good gauge of what some of the really most pressing questions are. And you can also, of course, put questions in the chat. And my colleagues, Vanessa Mason and Ben Hamamoto will be in there um, monitoring those. So let's get started. Um, Lisa K. Solomon is designer in residence at the Stanford D School, the, the School of Design. And um, you've been there about 11 months. Is that right, Lisa? That's Almost correct. That's correct. Teaching there for longer, but in this role, about 11 months. Great. So I'd love to start off, just tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing at the D School and what sort of, what's, what's your mission in being there? Yes, great. Well, Lynn, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and thrilled about the work that IFTF is doing around exploring the intersections of design and future. So I'm thrilled uh, and excited about your upcoming training and all the programs that you're doing and all the interest in this webinar. Uh, and that's very much my passion and the work that I'm doing at the D School, which is exploring the intersections between design and futures. And I come to this work and this role from a deep background in both. I have about 15 years of scenario planning experience, starting that practice at Global Business Network, which some of your foresight friends may remember. Uh, it was a firm started by futurist Stuart Brand, a Paul Earth Catalog, The Well, many other future-focused initiatives, Long Now Foundation, Peter Schwartz, who helped launch the scenario planning initiative and work at Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, and phenomenal, phenomenal community of future-focused thinkers. Uh, at the same time, I have a deep background in design and design as a leadership practice for navigating complexity and ambiguity uh, around strategic choices we may be facing. 
And what I found over time in my work at GBN and then subsequently when I started teaching at the MBA in design strategy up in San Francisco and more recently at Singularity University and the D School is that the practice of thinking about futures is very much a design practice. That in many ways, when we were doing scenario planning, in essence, we were having a designed conversation about the future. Uh, that's what led to my first book, Moments of Impact, that I co-authored with my colleague, Chris Hertel, who's still doing scenario planning work uh, at now Deloitte, um, and has really fueled my work and passion now, which is educating leaders of all ages, uh, including, yes, Stanford students, but even before K-12 and executives about the practices, the discipline, the skills that they can learn to think more generatively about the future and then to make design choices to bring their preferred future to life. So it's an incredible passion of mine. I'm feeling tremendous urgency to bring this to life in a variety of ways, through books, through classes, through programs like the ones we've been doing together because we know that the world is not getting uh, more simple. <laughs> it's getting more complex and filled with more ambiguity. So we need to rescale and retool. And it's exciting to me that these practices are available. And so say a little bit more about what actually you're doing at the D-School and why did the D-School decide at this point to bring in a, a foresight professional? A yes. yes, absolutely. And it's thrilling to see so many design practitioners on the, on the call today. Um, those of you may know the Stanford D-School, officially known as the Hasso Plattner Institute for Design at Stanford. Um, it has been around for about 15 years and it was really founded by uh, famed design thinker and uh, beloved professor David Kelly, who's also the founder of IDEO. Um, and the idea was to create an institute within Stanford's campus that would allow students to take classes to enhance their creative competence, to understand that this was not a mysterious skill, but this was something that could be learned and taught. Um, and to get a little bit more context for those that don't know, we are not a degree granting program. We are very much a experimental laboratory for teaching different kinds of classes in a, an experiential way. So our pedagogy is different and the type of content that we've done is different. Um, for many years, we have been focused on teaching the design thinking process. And in fact, um, I can actually show you a few slides to demonstrate the shift that's happened and give you a little bit more context for my work and what I was brought in to do. Great. Uh, so here we, here we go with technology. Okay. We're going to share my screen here, Lynn. Um, and let's see here. Okay, so hopefully everyone is now seeing a picture of the D-School. Is that what you're seeing, Lynn? Yep, looks good. Fantastic. So for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to come and visit, uh, the D-School is very much designed to be an open space to allow for different kinds of experiences. Everything is vertical, everything is open and often on wheels. Uh, we very much have a philosophy of learning by doing and experimentation. And as I started to say that for the first 14 or so years of its existence, it was very much focused on codifying and offering a process, a scaffold for how to bring a a mindset and a skill set of design thinking um, into any organization and certainly into our classes. And many people who are familiar with design will likely be familiar with this framework, this sort of hexagon framework of teaching people that a design oriented process first started with empathy, first started with understanding the needs and the requirements of the people you are designing for. Not necessarily what you want to design, but to do different methods of empathy and observation and ethnography to understand what's actually happening in context. Over the last few years, we have shifted our focus to build from this, to realize that just learning the process was not quite enough. That in this world that we are living in, it's much bigger than just a process. And so I want to share this new framework that's been emerging at the D School over the last year, which really sets the context for my work there as a foresight practitioner. We still tend to think about design in the context of products or things. You know, this is probably the, the iconic product that people think about. If you say, tell me something that's well designed, they'll say an iPhone, they may say a Tesla, they may say something else that is actually a, a, a thing, a physical thing. 
Over the years, we've learned that design actually fuels experiences, that we can apply that same method to say, well, if I, this product, this iPhone is well designed, it enables certain kinds of experiences that you can utilize through its platform. That increasingly requires systems around it in order to enable those experiences to be seamless. It requires systems of data, of storage, of cloud, of mobile connection. Increasingly, products are being fueled by advanced technologies. It's, uh, you'd have to work hard to open up a newspaper and not see conversations about AI or um, cryptocurrency or the technology that's now fueling the development of these products. And of course, technology is advancing faster and faster because of the data that's available. And these two things feed off of each other, all of which have implications for our society, for how we're living. And so we're really taking a much more expansive view about what design is in the context of this changing world. And I was brought in to explore, not just from the inside out, but from the outside in, using foresight, using futures methodologies to say, how do we get ahead of these implications? How do we productively and proactively think about second, third, or third order implications of emerging technologies, perhaps even in advance of uh, you know, what some of the creators of these technologies are thinking about. And of course, if you look at that through the lens of design, you start to say, well, what are the human implications of that? And how do we make sure that we are responsibly and ethically thinking about teaching design across all of these spectrums through the lens of users? Great, very exciting. And are you the only person at the D School who's really charged with this kind of this um, mandate to bring together the design and foresight communities? Or are there others there who are, would, would, would describe themselves as also foresight practitioners? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And what's wonderful about working at the D School is that it is truly a community of generative and multidisciplinary thinkers. So what I would say is where my primary role is to um, build relationships with, like, with, the, with the IFTF and other uh, foresight and futures practitioners um, that I've come to know over the course of time and would love to share some of that work we've done over the last year about some of those bridges. Uh, um, I'm very much in collaboration with my colleagues that run, for example, the K-12 lab. So we've got some exciting new futures initiatives already happening in the K-12 lab, which is focused on scaling new practices for teachers and leaders within K-12 administration, working very closely with my colleagues in teaching and learning that are designing the portfolio of classes um, that we offer. And so, for example, last year, I uh, co-taught a new class called Inventing the Future, which is very much focused on marrying creativity practices and futures practices against 50-year utopian and dystopian futures. Um, we're experimenting with new classes this year. In the fall, I'll be teaching one called Designing the Presidency. Very uh, interesting and timely topic. Um, so that's in collaboration with my colleagues there. Uh, I'm, I've been working with colleagues that focus on an effort at the D-School called the University Innovation Fellows, where they work with uh, leaders in universities, students and faculty that don't necessarily have access to a D-School within their campus, but want to use it as a way of launching new initiatives. So what's exciting is to see because there's so much close connection between design and futures, it's not a big stretch to say, you know, why don't we try this methodology? Because it's very much focused on um, applying design skills with a different lens. Um, and if that, you know, Ben, I may even take an opportunity to share with the group how also we've been shifting not only our framework of thinking about today's design work, but how our classes are shifting uh, in order to support that. So right. as I mentioned, you can see we're very much taking a broad view about what design work is and our, our classes reflect that and how we're shaping not only what we're doing with the students, but with the, the community more broadly. Um, the additional thing I'll say about that is that we've also been shifting our focus about not just teaching the process and the hexagons, which is very exciting for someone new to design, but how to think about applying the skills associated with that process in their everyday. And so over the last few years, my colleague, Carissa Carter, who runs teaching and learning at the D School has been articulating these eight design abilities that are really um, uh, touching almost all of our classes and all of our new experiments. So uh, for example, the idea of how do you learn from others, people in context, you would say, well, that has a natural affinity, the empathize phase, but you really need that throughout the entire process, how to experiment rapidly, how to synthesize information, 
how to build and craft intentionally, how to navigate ambiguity, how to communicate deliberately, how to move between concrete and abstract, and how to design or design work. And I can imagine, Lynn, as a foresight practitioner, many of the folks on this webinar are saying, wait a minute, that's exactly what I do in my practice, because it is. And so that's what's so exciting to me, is that we have this natural overlap, and we have an opportunity, just like design thinking has become an understandable practice that's scaled all sectors, and has really become more mainstream, whereas perhaps maybe a dozen years or so, people didn't really understand, I think that's what's on the horizon for futures. And so that's really what I'm driving through programs, through relationships, through different classes. How do we make these practices more accessible, not just for designing products and services and experiences, but also for imagining our new futures? I love it. I love it. So do you have other slides here that you want to share or that, that's good? That's that's. I think that's it for now. I mean, we can talk some examples if they're, if they're useful about how we're actually bringing this to life. But. Yeah, yeah, great. So I think um, that sort of ni nicely segues into the next um, set of questions that I want to explore with you, which is something that we're really focusing on here at the Institute as well. Um, we, of course, are a 50-year-old organization. We are solidly a futures and futures thinking and foresight organization. We have a lot of designers um, and, and folks with very diverse backgrounds on staff. And one of the things that we're noticing and why we are um, building our teaching and training efforts and why we're having this series of webinars is just the kind of really interesting ongoing evolution and blending and blurring of a lot of really professional practices, whether it's people who do innovation or strategy or consumer research or user research or designing experiences, the whole field of design itself. And so we're trying to, um, um, of course, from our point of view, we believe that foresight should be part of any process and that we want to see it kind of embedded in a lot, really any kind of strategic planning or design process that we see. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm just curious about what you're seeing in this space. My sense is that there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of experiments, there's a lot of interest. And um, it is really exciting because we would love to see, you know, um, it may be 10 years from now, there will be a school of foresight at Stanford, for example, um, just like there's a, a, a D school. So can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in this space um, embedded at the D school? What are some of the interesting um, cross-disciplinary projects and collaborations that are kind of exciting for you? Yeah, great. No, it's a super exciting time for futures uh, and design. And one of the fun conversations that I'm having with my colleagues is they're actually asking, like, is the practice of futures actually different than design? You know, right. are we just trying to carve out something that's really part of a larger umbrella? And I think it's a fair question. I mean, my approach is that any practice that allows you to think more expansively about understanding the problem in which you're trying to solve for and understanding the context and then understanding the wider range of possibilities than you may have considered with a more traditional, more linear way of thinking about it, um, that's all good, right? And I, and I think it's not helpful when we try to say, well, is that, you know, is that a design process? Is that a futures process? Is that, is that skeptical futures? Is that scenario planning? I mean, I know even within the futures, there's a lot of debate about like a scenario planning, the best, what other. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I just want to keep taking the like, the, maybe the plurality of futures in design, which is to say that all of these practices are important practices and that more futures and more design is good for everybody. Um, the more we talk about it. So I'm thrilled about the, the new work that, that you've been doing. I'm thrilled that we are um, that the futures community, I feel, does have some momentum at its back, that it felt um, like a, a sort of niche, almost, um, I don't want to say exclusive, but harder to access body of work that is becoming more open. And I hope that that continues to be the case. And so I very much am um, optimistic based on what I've seen the trajectory of design thinking go. I've been doing design thinking for over 20 years, informally taught, didn't really have a language. All of a sudden, the art of innovation came, comes along, and now there's a language, and so there's validity and credibility to it, which allows it to reach more audiences that may be less comfortable with it. But design thinking as a practice has been around for decades, right? It's not new. Right. Um, it's just been codified and made more accessible. 
I think that's exactly where we are right now in futures. Futures is not new. I mean, particularly for the futures practitioners that are that are on this. I mean, it's been around for decades, really codified first in the 50s and the Cold War and the Rand Corporation in response to some of the rising complexity of the geopolitical tensions and a way of navigating a variety of futures, sensitizing us to possibility. It's so much richer than that. And so now we're exciting. It's really exciting to see all the efforts uh, to write about it, to scale it, to bring it into strategic planning processes. Um, we're starting to see organizations um, take some of these more creative approaches to thinking about their future more seriously, bringing in science fiction writers, bringing in illustrators. Um, one of my colleagues who now works at Singularity um, helped bring that process in, for example, to Lowe's Corporation, like you know, a, a, a hundred plus year old hardware retail store, not necessarily what the pinnacle of innovation that you think of. And he was there to help get them to be more future focused about future retail and, and serving their customers in a different way. Um, and he uh, spent many years trying to get traction on his ideas. And it wasn't until he brought in science fiction writers and comic book illustrators where they created a comic book of the future which articulated, for example, an autonomous robot greeting customers as they would come into this really large, often overwhelming store that it captured the imagination of executives to say, wait a minute, could we do that? And within nine months, they had a working prototype. So I think we're starting to see even more traditional organizations be open to these different methods in order to ignite new ideas and bring them to life. And I think that's, that's really exciting. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And that's, that's kind of more on the foresight side. Um, one of the experiments that we're doing small scale is with uh, Nile HQ, which is a design group in um, um, Ireland, um, in the UK, actually. And, um, and, and they're service designers, and they are experimenting with bringing foresight practices into their design engagements. And I feel like there are a lot of bridges that need to be built um, to help people understand something, let's just say, even if it's a software product and I have a very soft, very fast development cycle, at which point do I bring foresight in? How do I integrate the long-term 10-year view with my next quarter execution? And, and the really, um, um, the, the design workflows and design processes that already exist. So I'm wondering if you're seeing any experiments of very practical collaborations between people designing things and people talking about the, the futures into which those things will, will be used. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, we can come back to it around how do you navigate the challenge of the 10 year and the now? I mean, that's always a tricky one about uh, the fact that thinking about the future takes time, but the pressure to deliver the plan that we agreed to last year is more urgent. And so how do you think about that? And what are some of the practices involved? Um, I would say at the D school, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to break down um, and uh, uh, barriers to understanding the drivers of the future, uh, specifically emerging tech. Um, and so, again, I'll, I'll give you an example of my uh, colleague, Carissa Carter, who's been doing some incredible work around making sure emerging tech is accessible to all because emerging tech will define our future. And our strong point of view is that if technology is supposed to serve all of us, then all of us should be a part of designing it. And we know that as technology becomes more advanced, the gap between feeling like you have any kind of knowledge to participate in the development of, say, AI and the algorithms behind it is, in getting, is it getting increasingly hard. And we're already seeing consequences of bias and what happens when the folks at the epicenter of designing these tech do not actually reflect all of us. Mm -hmm. So she has been doing this amazing work to actually break down what is an algorithm and why is it so important that we have fluency in algorithms in applying that towards problem solving? And so she actually created, and I have a little sample here I could show you, I'll show and tell. She created these incredible cards called I Love Algorithms, which is already like, hey, I love algorithms, you love algorithms. <laughs> and, she, and she created um, three different ways for you to understand different kinds of algorithms, and I'll just hold them up. Nice. So for example, this is a classification algorithm. And so she has a visual example, um, a description of kind of like how it might be used. Um, 
and and then the actual definition of what it is and you know this classification she's one for association she's one for clustering and over the course of the year she's been experimenting and creating a design workshop using these not first to teach people ai well ai is you know it's a neural network that blah 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 you know the way we've traditionally thought about it but said hey let's go tackle solving a problem and i was with her when we we were in front of 500 middle school and high school girls, so ages 11 to 18, that may not have had any prior exposure to algorithms, and start up to say, hey, look, let's say you want to create the greatest amusement park um, experience ever. So now we can think back to that layer D that I talked about, right? Let's create the greatest experience ever. What would that look like? So she's reaching them from something that's relevant to them. Oh, there'd be no lines. They would have my favorite food. Oh, parking would be easy. Oh, I could go on my favorite ride as much as possible. And she backs them into then understanding, well, what would the amusement park have to know? What data would they have to know? And then what algorithm might help them use that data? Okay, so she has them actually apply these methods to thinking about what would make this experience better? And then says, listen, if this were to scale and go, you know, bananas, all amusement parks across the country, what would that look like? So notice she's getting them into a futures mindset through a design lens. And then she says, well, how could this go wrong? Like, let's say that, that this data or, you know, what are, the, what are the risks associated? What data is not included in the set? So she's getting them to think critically about the wider implications of how this technology might be used through a way that they understand wildly successful in really closing that gap that you talked about around the different methodologies to help us again, imagine the kind of futures we want to see to life, the kind of futures that are possible to bring to life, and to be more aware of all of the different smaller decisions that go into it and who may be more um, uh, available to be a part of that and who might be left out. So, you know, notice embedded in their ethics, moral questions, equity questions. So it's really exciting work. Thank you. That's such a great, amazing example. Um, I want to, I'm going to give people time. If you have questions, we'll probably have another five or six minutes of uh, conversation and then we'll turn to your questions. Um, I'd love to hear, I guess what I'm, what I'm still sort of trying to work through for myself and I'd love to hear your take on it is what is it that, um, that foresight or futures thinking brings to the table that design really needs? And what is it that design brings to the table that foresight and futures thinking really needs? Yeah, love that question. And in fact, that has really been a big part of how I think about what kinds of programs um, I'm bringing there on behalf of both the D School community, Stanford, and the broader community. Um, in fact, that was the exact topic of a program that we hosted in the spring called The Futures Happening. Um, because the future is happening, and this was a happening about the future. And we brought in foresight practitioners and designers to explore this very question. And one of the themes that emerged was this notion that um, foresight and futures practices can help design take a longer term view of some of those choices. Um, it could help bring in an even different um, level of, of uh, multiplicity of perspectives. A lot of design is really great when done well at understanding the intended user and really going deep on that thick data of going after the user, spending time with them, getting the qualitative data. Futures is really good at getting that peripheral vision, the multiplicity of perspectives and really going for the non-obvious in that way. So informing not just what is the initial uh, implication of this choice, but what could be the choice, what might be the implication two or three steps down the line, right? So you get more of that with that longer term lens, as well as the multiplicity of perspectives. So I think futures really adds that outside in perspective. I would say that's the third part, which is the context in which you are designing. Again, design is really good from the inside out. Futures is like, what's happening in the world around us? What's happening around the driving forces? What's truly uncertain and how do we need to track that? What's more of a predetermined and how do we weight that differently as we think about where this thing may show up that we are designing for? On the flip side, I kind of alluded to this, design is really good at focusing on the person, right? I mean, a futures is macro and you know, big picture and creates narratives of possible futures. Who lives in those narratives? What are their specific needs in those narratives? So design is really good at, at getting granular. Design is really good at prototyping. Design is really good at giving form to specific new ideas. And so when those two blend, it's 
you know, it's just so exciting. It's expansive around thinking about prototyping, prototyping at different levels, thinking about understanding potential opportunities and equally important potential risks. So I think that that opportunity for them to speak language and become, you know, truly ambidextrous, right? And thinking about these different ways, top down, bottom up, outside in, inside out, oh, let's go deep on this person. Now let's go macro and make sure that we're not missing something. I think that's what's going to create a resilience and a robustness, um, hopefully at scale. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for me, since I'm not a designer and you, I think, are, you know, such a great person in the role that you're in because you are, you come from both worlds. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the, you know, a, a, a part of what we do as foresight practitioners is help people pre-experience the future. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make it vivid. We're trying to make, create a sense of that I have a, I have an emotional connection with the future and yes. I have a stake in it and it matters to me. It's not abstract, um, which of course is a design process. And um, so I, th I think one of the, um, the future of experience design and the experience design of the future um, is um, seems to me to be a really fruitful uh, kind of place for us to continue to collaborate going forward. Um, I totally to agree with that, Lynn. And also I would say, and I'm just a newbie at this, so I, I can't wait to see where it's going to go. Imagine being able to do that more seamlessly with AR and VR to get in yes. that visceral, you know. And so, so we're already starting to see some of that convergence, right? Science fiction is being taken more seriously. You start to hear leaders, you know, say, "Wow, we need to, we need to use, for example, Ready Player One as the book, the onboarding book for all of our new employees." You know, right. that's kind of getting them into a future right. mindset. Um, we're catching up, right? All the pieces are being developed at different stages. So in many ways, the technology is advancing, but now we got to get the content, right? The 3D um, designers of the content to be on board. I was just having this conversation um, yesterday with a colleague of talking about powerful leadership experiences. We did this VR escape room a little while ago. So we had the VR on it. We had the thing on our back. It was some dystopia for the future. Um, some planet and we had to work together. So it, was, it had all the benefits of an escape room, you know, the, the sort of tactical for those that have done that where, you know, you're given clues, you're put into this new environment, but it had this futures aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And so it was very powerful to understand where the technology was going, but still the story was so basic. I mean, it felt like a five-year-old sci-fi. Right. Um, you know, it, so I think there's a lot of opportunities for more conversations, more convenings, more projects that people work on together to get to what you're talking about the benefit of that visceral experience of the future using technology that's available to us told through a narrative that feels personal and urgent um, and so I think I think we're just getting there um, in prep for this and I and I'm still thinking about it because uh, I don't quite know the answer but I was saying to myself what is the current state of futures and how could we get it more out there and in some ways I realized we actually have more futures than ever before mm -hmm. Because people are, I think, worried about what all of this, um, all of these new, not only the new technology, but also the events that we're seeing unfold yes. uh, play out around, for example, natural disasters. I mean, we just had this incredible storm on the East Coast, Brooklyn's flooding, subways are flooding, like it's right there in front of us, right? So we're, in some ways, we're getting lots of doomsday scenarios about how the world is changing, you know, so for technology here about all these jobs that are going away and automation. But I'm not sure we still have the sense making yet built in around like what to do about that. Right. So, um, so like now I think our job is shifting a little bit to say, how do we help people break apart these potential futures so that they can productively do something, right? right. Like we know futures job is not just about painting new futures. It's actually about arming people with a variety of choices to mitigate at the very least the negative future that we can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how to frame actions in a different way. Um, I just have one last quick thing, which is, what do you, you wrote a, a really nice piece. You've been doing some great, um, writing some great articles on something that you called future-centered design. Um, our last webinar, we talked to um, Ming Li Chai and Harold, um, oh God, now I've blanked on his last name, Becker, um, at uh, Microsoft's Envisioning Group, and, and Ming Li likes the term human-centered foresight. Um, so talk a little, just a little bit about language. So human-centered foresight, 
future-centered design, there's futures thinking, there's strategic foresight, yeah. there's, there's design futures, there's speculative futures, right. there's speculative design. What do you, how do you describe, like, what, what language do you, are you using right now that, that's working for you? Yeah, such a great question. Uh, and I know that language is important, right? I mean, yeah. think about how design thinking was named something that now at least people can understand. It's also led to some misunderstanding of what it is as well. So language is really important. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm still developing my point of view about yeah. language. I would say, I guess in the spirit of a true designer, I want whatever language that the other person I'm communicating to is going to get and be excited about. Right. So my instinct tells me that futures thinking or something with futures, not future, um, is important yeah. because having that plurality of understanding that the future is not one thing, it's multiple things, is absolutely critical to how we talk about this work. Um, I personally understand foresight and uh, have taught foresight and understand the, the um uh, the history behind it and have, you know, many colleagues that, that write books and articles on it. I get, what I worry about the word foresight is that it's, um, it certainly, it, 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 it um, connotes like a single, like a foresight, right? It, it's, it's a singular and B, it still feels a little um, removed, right? Yeah. Like it's this thing that you need a lot of degrees to understand. So, so I think that there will be a role for foresight and for the discipline and the science behind foresight. But from my perspective around what I care about, I want as many people to, as possible to feel comfortable imagining new futures right. and to have the critical thinking skills to be able to understand how to respond to that. So uh, that's, that's, not, that's not a definitive uh, uh, sort of answer, but at least that's, that's where I'm heading. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the moment that we're at. We're building right. new vocabulary and the new practices. So I'm going to turn to um, questions, and we, we, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to. So there's a, a question first about will the slides be available? Um, I think we can, Lisa, could you, you're welcome, happy to share your slides, yeah? Absolutely. I, you know, and more importantly, we're, we'll, we'll share some articles behind them so that way people can also understand. So, for example, there's a wonderful article about the eight abilities, and so we'll, we'll definitely make some resources available. Um, I think that we can email them to attendees on this, so we'll, we'll do that. Um, there's a, a question about favorite books and magazines that, <laughs> that people could get inspired from. I'd love to hear what your top top three or four are, are or five even that you're. Oh my gosh, it's changing all the time. Um, sometimes when I do webinars, people ask like, you know, that bookshop behind you is that for real? Is that one of those like <laughs> Western? You know. <laughs> they're real, uh, uh, you know. So they do look color coordinated, though. I tried. That was a little <laughs> bit of my summer project. I will admit. Thank you for <laughs> noticing. Thank you. I spent a little time. We're not done yet. I couldn't decide total color coordinating or by category. Or my futures. <laughs> I got my design. Whatever. Um, so Amy, it's changing right now. I'm really excited about a book that just came out, actually called Range by David Epstein, which is a really important book for both futures and design about you know how generalists. Um, uh, uh, are sort of more effective in many ways in a specialized world. Um, and so it, I think for, for those, um, particularly the, the foresight folks on the call, I think that they'll, they'll really appreciate um, how he talks about his research around how generalists are more fluid between disciplines mm -hmm. and why that's so important, particularly as it relates to learning. Um, so the, I, name of the, book? the name of the book is called Range. Okay. Um, by by David, uh, David Epstein. Okay. Um, that's a that's a really important book. Um, let's see another uh, a book that I love um, for those people. And I just recommended this the other day. Okay, not a new book. So that's a brand new book. Here's not a here's not a brand new book. Um, if if for those people looking to bring these practices within their organizations, um, I love the book Switch by Dan and Chip Heath. Um, mm -hmm. It is a design book, even though they don't call it a design book. But if you think about, you know, how they talk about where change happens, um, you know, they talk about it from the rational perspective, the emotional perspective, and the context perspectives. So I think that's a really um, important book. Let me just make sure I'm not missing any. Um, yeah. Another, well, it's kind of, it actually may even be out of, oh, this is another book that I'm loving right now. This is a more... Um, a uh, timely book, but um, this book just came out in April uh, by Eric Liu called Become America, where mm -hmm. he talks about um, 
again, he didn't necessarily say it this way, but when I met him and I said, like, you know, you're having design conversation about what does it mean to be an active citizen in this world? Um, so he started this thing called Citizen University, which is creating civic seminaries around the country to have productive conversations about what does it mean to, uh, to be a citizen. And, and so they're, they're sort of structuring it off of a kind of religious experience where they have text, but in this case, it's not a religious text. It's like bit from the Constitution or from Rosa Parks or from um, Thoreau, and then he's creating a, a kind of seminar about it to, to spur productive dialogue. So I love examples of that where we're, we're using design, but not necessarily with our like design cape on, you know, it's like design right. through the Trojan horse to get into thinking dialogue, learning dialogue, um, generative dialogue. Um, so that's, that's really where my interest um, is right now. Right, and you wrote a book um, yes. about strategic conversations, which yes. I completely agree with. I mean, in some sense, what we're doing is improving the quality of conversation. I mean, that's it's so that we can- A hundred percent, a hundred percent, right. And um, so that book is called Moments of Impact, uh, How to Design Strategic Conversations to Accelerate Change. I'm really proud of it. It's over five years old. I wish it came out now, so it had yeah. the relevancy. So I'm thinking about bringing it forward. Um, and one of the things I'm proud of is that we used our design practices for the book. There's actually a starter kit in the back because we know people don't have time to read. So we have all these suggestions about try this, do this, ask this. Um, and I am thinking about, you know, putting it out a new version, particularly in the current context that we're in, um, just to help us have better conversations throughout our whole life, not just when we're in the boardroom, but, you know, how do we have conversations with our family? How do we have conversations, you know, with our colleagues? And I think the quality of conversations really reflect the quality of learning and the quality of ideas that we have. And it just it turns out to be a very underdeveloped skill that's critical for leaders everywhere. I agree. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Um, are the AI cards available online? Not yet, cards. not yet, not yet, but, but, but we're working on it. Okay, very good. Um, and then we have a question from Ryan Hornberg about kind of um, how do you articulate the value of, of an approach, especially in a large corporate environment or really even any large institution, it could be a large nonprofit or a large government agency. Um, what objections do you typically encounter when you're introducing in particular futures and forecasting and foresight, and how do you typically respond? <laughs> we have another hour, Ryan, to talk about that. <laughs> uh, great questions, all great questions. Um, and this is, again, what, what, what an opportunity to apply our design mindset within the context of futures. So your design, my first instinct is you need to know your organization. You have to apply those empathy skills and observation skills to understand what currencies does my organization care about? Because that's the leverage and the language that I'm gonna use in order to make the case for futures. If you go in there with your futures cape and your, you know, your, your, your post-its and Sharpies and you're like, you know what we need? Futures, right? Without really understanding, does this, care, does this organization care about new ideas? Does this organization care about growth? Does this organization care about not being blindsided? Is this a, 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 a you know, a new organization or a defending organization. That will help orient how you articulate the value of futures. Because you could certainly make the case that a futures practice or adding a component of futures to an already existing practice in a very small way would be very additive on a generative sense, might help you see an opportunity that you're not seeing if they care about growth. Or on the flip side, if it's a larger organization and they're worried about being disrupted, you could make the case that this is about not being blindsided. This is about adding resilience. And I would also argue, particularly if it's new to the organization, to start small and not to claim it as a futures thing, because that's immediately when people go up. Nobody, this is a truism, nobody likes to feel stupid, ever. And particularly the higher up you go, the less they want to feel stupid. Right. So if you introduce something to them that they've never experienced, that they don't understand, their immediate reaction is going to be no. So you have to earn your way there, right? So now we're talking about rapid experimentation and prototyping. So maybe you have a brown bag lunch. Maybe you invite a speaker. Maybe you just add a component of visioning. So you just slowly get them involved versus like slapping down the body of work that says, we've got to read this. So all kinds of ways to introduce it. Your job as the introducer is to embrace that design a mindset to understand what's going to get the easiest and most 
interested reaction from your stakeholder group. Hmm. Right. Very, very good. Um, so a, a little diff different kind of a question from Tom Culver. Um, and he's asking about uh, the role of users and the kind of the, the nature of especially digital innovation, um, which has a lot of user generated um, contributions. Mm -hmm. um, and he's asking how that the, the, the role of the user is changing the nature of design and how it also might change the nature of futures thinking. That is such a good question. Thank you for that question. Um, it's one of the trickiest parts, I think, about futures and, and design as a blended discipline, which is design is so focused on, you know, what we call going to the Gemba, right? Go to the source, watch people, use people. Don't just make up what you think they want and let the features and functions get away from you without actually watching right. people, how you use your stuff. How do you do that for the future? Because by definition, unless we've, somebody's invented time travel on this uh, seminar, on this webinar, we can't go visit our future selves, right? We can imagine what the future self might be and what the needs may be, but we actually can't observe them in the future. We just can't. So, so that's a tricky part of the practice. There's no doubt about it. And that's sometimes where I see some practices of like sci-fi, DI, uh, that's science fiction design intelligence, and others can get astray from the standpoint of when there is a disconnect between um, leaders that want tangible, relevant action now, and sci-fi DI has gone way off on some you know, deep end that's like too far-fetched, and then you lose credibility. So I don't have a great answer other than to say it is tricky, right? Um, and so I think like being steeped, being clear about who your intended users are, trying to understand who they are right now as much as possible, there's absolutely no substitute for that. So really, really spending time and then, you know, spending time to try to articulate out like where they might be and then to prototype and then get their feedback. Just trying to get as much concrete data and evidence as possible, knowing that it's imperfect, knowing that it's imperfect. Right. The other thing that I would say that is often, I think, lost in design thinking when people spend so much time immersing themselves in, in users, which is so critical, is that um, they forget to develop their own point of view. Hmm. And I think that's really, really critical. Um, you know, like a lot of times I'll get pushback, you know, Steve Jobs never interviewed customers what they wanted. He just did it. That's right. Right. But he also spent a lot of time observing customers to develop his own point of view. He didn't ask them, do you like this or this? Do you want this feature or this feature? But it doesn't mean he wasn't steeped in watching and understanding human behavior, right? Like there is no substitute for really understanding human behavior in order to inform your own point of view that the, you then go out and test. Um, so I think the same is true with futures, like developing a point of view about, you know, which futures is useful, not to be correct, but as we said earlier, is a useful prompt for a different kind of conversation or different type of, of exploration. Yeah, I think that's so important. Um, I mean, part of the thing that we are doing in our foresight training is helping, uh, giving people um, the tools to develop a more confident uh, perspective on the long-term future. Yeah. Um, and as you said, there's never a guarantee. It's not about being right or wrong, but it, it is, uh, it's hard um, when you haven't done it a lot to um, have confidence in your own assessment of how the world is changing and what it might mean in 10 years and how that might, but, but I think having that context seems as you said, critical for designing anything, whether it's a strategy or a service or a new product. So um, yeah. that skill, I think, and having the point of view seems um, actually possibly somewhat of something that's been missing from some of the technologies and services and platforms that we have today, resulting in the kinds of um, conflicts and challenges that we have. That's right. Um, and as we know, right, right, strong, ideas loosely held, right? I mean, we've got yeah. to still be able to, you know, exactly. to change them, right? Like it's okay to have a strong opinion, but you have to be open. Yeah. And one of, I think that the greatest gifts that any futures process can offer someone who's been involved with it is that they literally start to take in information differently. They seek out different kinds of information. Yes. They pay attention to yeah. stories that wouldn't have even like hit them. You know, I always joke, at least in the old time when I started doing this, like you'll pay more attention to the story on section D page six, 
than you ever did before because you've created a narrative that opened up that neural pathway, right? That side story or that side tweet. Right. Um, so I think that's really important is to make sure that we're expanding the realm of what's even in our observable purview to help make us more informed. It's about adaptability than it is about, you know, that correctness. Right. Um, and I would just add, I mean, I, my background is in cultural anthropology. So my, one of my primary methods is, you know, participatory ethnography and observation. And um, there are, you know, we, we always in our work, our foresight and our, our, our forecasts are always grounded in evidence from today. Um, and that is, that is about the end user that is about. So, so the evidence come from them, but also the attitudes, the, the changing values that people have today, those are all shaping the future context. Um, all right. So these are all great questions we could talk for a maybe long time. Maybe we could about. capture them. Like maybe someone in your team can capture them. So maybe those that we don't get to now, you know, we'll be able to come back to in some way. I would love um, to see them anyway. I always say there's data in questions. Yes. Um, I want to, so it looks like Neil Coleman, our, our partner at Nile HQ, um, the design agency I was talking about is, is um, in the chat. And so Neil has a question about, um, as a designer, and, and Neil, again, has, has been experimenting with bringing foresight into um, his uh, you know, uh, processes with his clients, as his design clients. And Neil and I will be doing a session on this at the upcoming um, Ethnographic Practice and Industry Conference, EPIC in Rhode Island this fall, if anyone's interested in following up on that. Um, and if you guys could put the Nile HQ link into the chat. Um, so Neil's question is, um, it's hard when you're used to zooming in as a designer, it's hard to build a macro view of many complex interrelated topics. Can you share your experience of meeting that challenge? Gosh, so true, Neil. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, they use different parts of our brain, right? That detailed orientation to zoom in versus the where does it fit? I mean, one of the things we haven't explicitly said, but I think is critical on the future of both of these fields is systems thinking. Mm -hmm. Again, not a new discipline, not mm -hmm. a new discipline, but something that's becoming more and more important as an explicit practice to help us understand the connection between the micro and the macro and all the different players involved. That is a form of critical thinking that's been highly underdeveloped. Right. I mean, you know, I would like to see in the future that not only do we have a school of foresight and futures or that, that that's a part of just the way we think about design without having to caveat it is that systems thinking is absolutely critical. You know, in K-12, I, I would love to see that. I mean, the thing about all of these practices is that they're not more widely adopted because they haven't been mandated as a literacy worth knowing. Right. And that has to change. That just has to change. I mean, that's why I spent a lot of my time in K-12, even volunteering to say, how are we developing the pipeline of our future leaders? there's a lot of work to be done there because we're still in the industrial model of regurgitating known answers when in fact we are increasingly entering and participating and, and shaping a world with not only more unknown answers, but even more unknown questions. So we, we need to dramatically change the way we think about the foundational literacies that we're developing in order to ultimately get to, you know, when, they, when they're out of school and they're, and they're you know, active in the world. I think that some of the um, work that Alex McDowell is doing um, around world building is a great example. Alex, um, McDowell. Alex McDowell, right down at, at USC and world building. And he was involved um, very early on, for example, in the development of minority report. Um, and so, so, you know, learning from both the way his brain works and how he's using his cinematic skills to, mm -hmm. to give visual form to these complex world that then, you know, feature, you know, small, uh, micro stories within that, um, you know, lots of different kinds of, of um, disciplines that we can learn from in order to do that better. But the short answer is you're absolutely right. It's hard. We need people with different talents and we need to create the environment and the context by which that they can learn and work with each other. And I mean, it occurs to me as you're saying this, that there are lots of different disciplines which um, are taught, which, which also are about systems, including history, including literature, 
art. You know, there are a lot of different um, angles um, uh, that we can approach that from. Philosophy. Right. I mean, uh, you know, philosophy, like, absolutely. You know, how do we get yes. comfortable with Little that layer science. thinking, yeah. right? Like, how do we get comfortable yeah. holding two, you know, potential um, uh, opposite but true um, truths, right? <laughs> you know, like uh, yes. So all all of those things, and, and in fact, you know, going back to the book question, another book that I love is not new, um, but it was written by my dear colleague and um, mentor, Eamon Kelly, who used to run uh, Global Business Network. He's now the Chief Futurist Officer at Deloitte. He wrote a book called Powerful Times, where he articulated these seven tensions back in 2005 mm. that will change the trajectory of our world. Tensions like prosperity and decline, technology acceleration and pushback, mm. clarity and craziness. Can mm. you imagine? Almost 15 years ago. So I, I'm pushing on him to re-release it, but um, a very, very powerful and different way to practice existing in those worlds, right? And this gets back to my earlier comment. Most of our education rewards right answers. We don't have right answers. <laughs> so we got to get more comfortable living within that ambiguity. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, and maybe we can get to another depending. But the question is from um, Myra Madriz. And she says, could you share some reflections on the challenges and opportunities of both design and futures thinking for the built environment, which is slower to develop and harder to change than technology or consumer products? Yeah, 100%. A great question. A great question. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is time, right? I mean, and, and these... These devices, the way that we're using them, not helping us think slower, <laughs> you know, so we need, you know, a lot of this work, design work, futures work requires contemplation, it requires conversation, it requires sitting in the problem for a while before we decide what to do with it. We, we are not, our, our current built environment is not rewarding that. <laughs> so that's really tricky. Um, and I think that the question alludes to an important um, reality, which is that things don't change at the same pace. Mm -hmm. um, and I will then point you to another fabulous framework that articulates that from Stuart Brand on pace layers. And what Stuart observed with his fascination of architecture and buildings, and he actually wrote a fabulous book called How Buildings Learn, he understood that buildings don't change at the same rate, meaning you can change paint like that. Harder to change walls, hard, even harder to change foundation or plumbing. So he tried to articulate that change happens at different, what he calls, pace layers. Mm -hmm. So he then, when he wrote a, another wonderful book called um, The Clock of the Long Now, fabulous book, uh, he, he articulated what he has seen around the change um, and how to think about disruption and incremental change through the lens of these layers. So he talks about, for example, fashion moves quickly, and we're used to that, right? Like, what's, what's the current fashionable trend? Um, below that is uh, commerce, right? How do we think about commerce supporting fashion? Below that is infrastructure. Below that is governance. Below that, and this is the interesting one, is culture, mm -hmm. right? Which we tend to think moves faster than it does, and below that is nature. And what he observed is that the layers are meant to absorb change from the top down. But when you have change from the bottom up, for example, these once in a generation floods happening every week, Right. That's what causes disruption and revolution. And I think that's what's happening, not only with technology, you know, disrupting the in-between of these layers, um, but also how that's now, now changing the environment and the built environment within which we work. Not, a, again, a definitive answer, other than to say that there are frameworks that help us understand how to actually use our agency right. to work within that system of, for example, a built environment that may have different layers that move at different paces. Okay, um, I want to ask Lisa if you can share the, our final slide, which tells yes. us to get in touch with us, with both you and with me. And um, uh, Ali Zaman asks if we can provide some guidance on how a well-experienced and remarkable generalist could find themselves working with teams and organizations like the D-School and I IFTF to <laughs> solve big design challenges or achieve breakthrough innovation, asking for a friend. And um, I think that, I don't think we can go into it um, in, in detail now, but I think you should, you, we welcome um, uh, reaching out to both of us. Um, you can um, um, 
join us for an, an IFTF training somewhere in the world. If it works for you, there are other you know, futures uh, and, and design uh, experiences and trainings around. We will send out, we'll find some way um, to send out the, the, the reading list that we have here and um, we'll be having another one of these Foresight Talks webinars with Dmitry um, Garebtsov, who is running an amazing global consumer foresight team at Nestle Food and doing projects like the top 10 most popular dishes in every country oh. and what those might look like in 10 years. So join us for that. We also have a newsletter here at the Institute um, for our foresight training, which we're happy to um, add you to, and that's full of kind of information. Lisa, do you have other ways people can connect with you or what you're doing at the D School? Well, um, absolutely. You know, our Twitter is up there and um, email, but also go to the D School and, you know, we're always adding resources. We're actually revamping some of our materials. We had put up uh, many years ago a boot camp to design thinking. We're in the process of, of updating that. Um, so I think it's important. That's a great way to, to continue to develop your, in your own skills and practice as you connect with others. I absolutely want to put in a huge plug for IFTF and the wonderful materials that they put out. Um, this spring, I had an incredible opportunity to teach with IFTF's Jay McGonigal on their incredible work designing an ethical operating system. That is a fabulous, fabulous resource and tool. So just start using these things. I mean, the, I think the, the thing that's true with both design futures and certainly the blended discipline is that we get better through practice. So expose yourself to the tools and start practicing them and share them with others and build a community of practice. Um, and that's the best way to stay involved. You will attract a community and you will find yourself among fellow travelers and it makes the work so interesting, so exciting and so important. So I think it's important that we continue to not only share what we're doing, but also learn from you. I forgot to say something very important, which is that IFTF will have a future specialization free course and training on Coursera on the Coursera platform, which is being developed by our colleague Jane McGonigal using the best of our tools and uh, integrating a lot of our research. So that will be on the Coursera platform. It will be a five course future specialization and those are available, accessible to anyone online and that will be launching uh, before the end of the year. So please also do check that out. Um, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. This has been really fun and very exciting. Now I'm going to go check out a bunch more things. I love those questions. Um, and it suggests that we have a really vibrant community to, to, lear to learn from and work with. Yes. And um, hope to see everyone in different venues. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.